Thank you. Thanks all for being here on this last morning of the conference. That's not everyone. Um, I'm the second author to the paper. Um, too bad Jeffrey, the first one, couldn't make it because he's actually the expert on dance music. I'm considering myself more a casual visitor of dance music events, but uh, if I get some of the specific sub-genres wrong, I already apologize on the <laughs> forehand. Um, but I think I know, know, know enough about it to, get to do this presentation, and I've been heavily involved in both theory, design, and methodology and analysis of this study. So. I think I have quite a lot, so I'm gonna get started. Um, first, I'm gonna I want to start with a sort of terminological clarification. I'm not saying that our de definition of EDM or electronic dance music is the correct one. I understand that here in the UK, it has been the term has been used in slightly different way than they do in Belgium. So, we are actually going to use it in this study as an umbrella term or an overall term that refers to all these specific genres as a category. So, I know that there are approaches where EDM is somewhere in here, in the region of electro uh, kind of music where it's considered a subgenre in itself, that's not how I am going to use the term today for me, I use it. But I have understood that in England they usually use dance or dance music as the umbrella term, so it might be that in your head, if I say EDM, you think dance. Um, very specifically we will use it as an umbrella term for these genres who have who are actually highly popular in Belgium and in Holland. And it's a pragmatic approach. We targeted dance events, dance festivals, and we use the terms that they use in their own promotion. So they often promote themselves as house events, techno events, trance events, psychedelic dubstep drum and bass or hard style hardcore. Um, so we use it as an umbrella term, and mostly as an umbrella term for these genres. At the same time, I think I'm going to talk both about hugely popular uh, events like here Tomorrowland, or more underground, less mainstream club style events that are uh, not so mainstream. So that's the terminological clarification I want to do in the beginning. The study then, um, I might be an odd one out because I'm going to present statistical analysis. Um, the goal is actually, I think there's a lot of fascinating theory on subcultures, neo-tribes, communities of practice, and I really like reading into that, but I'm more schooled like media psychologists, and uh, we usually try to question larger samples of people to see if we can find general tendencies. So what I'm actually going to try to do is to see if there's a way in which I can translate cultural theory that exists on dance music cultures and make it fit for more quantitative, large scale type of analysis. So I apologize already on beforehand for the statistics <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going to present. And if it's too dull, you just raise your hand. <laughs> um, first, a bit of theory. Um, so, sociologically, uh, electronic dance music and the processes of group formation, of identity formation, um, a lot of sociological concepts have been used to describe the feeling of groupness or of togetherness people have at these events. Even though the notion of subcultures has by now largely been abandoned, uh, some others still use it, like for instance Susanna Kaplova, who uses it to describe the rave culture in um, Slovakia, I think. But mostly recent, or in the past 15 to 20 years, um, under the impulse of 
Rupa Hooker and Andy Bennett. Um, the notion has been abandoned and more, yeah, the scenes and scenes as tied to different uh, et uh, et ethnic or demographic backgrounds or the notion of the postmodern tribe have been suggested and forwarded as replacements or new ways of redefining what a subculture is. Um, more based on the agency or the creation of a, a, a shared identity to, to practice or to entrepreneurial agency. Golding et al. have done quite some interesting studies on that. So I find all that very interesting. At the same time, we have a, a fragmented theoretical field where different characteristics of the EDM culture are touched upon by different authors who use different sociological concepts. And I find that very interesting. Um, but then the quantitative researcher in me tries to think like, okay, is there a way that we can integrate these things into one another? Um, so recently, um, the focus of attention has shifted somewhat towards not sociological group concepts, but more based on the experience uh, people have when they go to a dance music event. I find that very interesting too, because I think it helps already to solve a bit the problem of thinking in sociological categories and trying to classify everything. I think it's a more flexible way of thinking about it. So, liminality has already been mentioned, I think, in both previous presentations. Um, and it, there's a lot of interesting literature on that, that actually <coughs> these dance music events, or EDM, as I said in the beginning, that they offer like a space and a time that is somewhat in a different set of rules from reality and that has a space on its own and whereby uh, people enter that space as a way of escaping their mundane lives, lives or escaping their everyday lives and where for a while they get to be or to live some other role than they are expected to in reality. So it's often described as an escape from the mundane. Sometimes it's, it, it goes even further and it's seen as a way to experiment with alternative identities that you can put on clothes or try to behave in a way that you wouldn't dare or want to do in real life, but it can be liberating. And as has been said before, it can go even further that the liminal space actually offers somewhat of a ritualistic or sacral experience. So I really like these theories because they uh, shift the focus from sociological group to experience. So what we did then was we um, made a summary of all characteristics of the EDM experience that we found in literature and these we later on translated into a questionnaire that we distributed online. So I'm gonna quickly sum up the different characteristics that we, uh, that we found based on the literature study. Um, the EDM experience is characterized by a transcendence of one's class, ethnicity, gender sometimes. Um, the people who visit an EDM event um, enjoy a temporal visual appearance, so clothing is important for them, the way they look, but not like in a subculture where the kind of clothes you wear are your permanent style. This is more a liminal thing where you wear clothes that you would not wear in everyday life or that you, f you enjoy wearing but would not want to wear all the time. Um, visitors as co-creators was one uh, characteristic that we found in a lot of texts. So it's not artist, audience, 
or organizer audience, but uh, the audience responds to the artist. The audience gives input to the organizers, and so the community that emerges is somewhat interactive, you could say. Uh, consumer linking value means that uh, the people who visit the event are as much connected to the other people or feel as much connected to the other people who are there than they feel to the music. Um, freedom of music choice has been forwarded as an important characteristic. Also, unlike in subcultures where you are expected to stick to that one style and that's it, it's something that EDM music, is, especially the bigger festivals, are breaking loose from. And that limin liminality, like the weaker community-oriented uh, person, and then the more realistic, uh, ritualistic and sacral characteristics. So these are all characteristics that we started from. And then we asked the question, can we oper operationalize them? Can we make a questionnaire wherein we measure uh, these characteristics and find a reliable statistical way to investigate them. So can we operationalize it into a quantitative survey? And if we can, can we, by using statistical analysis, um, <coughs> define across genres, for instance, which of these characteristics are more important, or define across boundaries of gender or education level or age that some of these characteristics are more important to younger people or others are more important to older visitors. So that's actually the ultimate goal, but first we have the methodological issue of operationalizing these uh, characteristics as dimensions. So what we did is we took all of these characteristics that I just summarized and we, well, we brainstorm basically about what questions can we ask in a questionnaire to measure these things. For instance, I'll, I'll give an example later on. So we have a lot of brainstorms about these questions. We have colleagues who are also experts, we call them in the field, like, do you think these questions would work or do, do you think these questions would be interpreted as such? And so we came up with a whole list of questions, usually around seven, eight for each characteristic. Um, and then we do a pretest, um, and based on that, we change the questions. Um, so that's the first phase of what we did. We developed a questionnaire that probed into these characteristics. Here's an example. Yeah, it's in Dutch, so you might understand it. <laughs> But you might be the only one, I think. Um, so, for instance, with um, respect to liminality and the religious experience, like we ask five questions that probe into that the experience of a dance fest feels religious, it feels supernatural. Uh, it resembles a religion. I see myself as a believer of the dance culture religion. Um, it transcends the human. Um, so, that's what we did for all these characteristics. So then, we put the questionnaire that we developed, we put it online, and we tried to have as many people as possible to fill it out, and just to show that we did a lot of effort to get as many respondents as possible we did. I think we had it all in, all together, like, this, this, these are not even all uh, Facebook groups and f online forums that we used to distribute it. I think we had like 70 or so. So it's not easy if you have such a if you have such a large questionnaire uh, that people have to fill it out online. So eventually we had 339 uh, respondents who filled it out completely. Um, a large majority males, I think that's an interesting point for discussion, why that is, because we did a lot of effort. Um, so it could be, it means that within the cultures that we target, or on the online groups on them, a lot more males are active. Um, I think it's an interesting point of discussion and an important point. 
mostly young people and well predominantly Flemish and Dutch Flemish is Dutch speaking Belgian so a bit more uh, Dutch uh, than Belgians we asked them um, we're gonna ask you questions about a dance event that you recall well and then we asked them to keep that one specific event in mind through all the whole, throughout the whole questionnaire. So this is somewhat the, uh, the statistics of the different uh, genres that they had in mind as, the, as a typical dance event. So the harder styles were more, most strongly represented while trance and psychedelic slightly less. So, yeah, we then did a prince, an exploratory principal component analysis to see if our questionnaire worked out. Um, I don't have the whole factor loadings table. I, I, if someone's interested in that, I can, I can give it to you. But this basically says that it, it kind of works well. If these are the above 0.8, that's pretty good. Um, and so it means that for transcendence, we had. Four, we retained four questions for visual appearance, which were maintained five. So that's basically saying, okay, our, our questionnaire worked. Um, and so it also means we can use all these characteristics that we measured in upcoming analysis. Um, and hopefully it gives us a better insight in how people experience these events. Um, over over different sources of events and genres. So I'm quickly going to go through some interesting findings there. Um, so it's one of the interesting things we found was that the younger people are, the more the more strongly they feel that the religious aspect of liminality is is there. Um, and also the more strongly they feel that it's important that an, at a dance event or an EDM event they can uh, experiment with or try out new types of personalities. So I think this one makes sense in the sense that they are in, in, in the process of identity formation. This is something we can discuss about, I think. Maybe the older you get, the less naive you get, I don't know, or, <laughs> well, maybe I'm just all the same. Uh, very interesting is also that we found uh, important differences between males and females. So males are more interested in being interactive with the, with the DJs, with the organizer, in participating in that whole process. Um, and they are also more interested in seeking connection with other enthusiasts and they are also more interested in the ritualistic aspects while females are more interested in the visual appearance and the fact that you can freely choose your music. So we don't know that well yet how, how to interpret that or how to relate that to theory so all suggestions here are welcome. Um, very interesting is also this is kind of complicated, but if you see the harder, we ask them how how they would rate or favor these different genres, and so what we find is people who like the harder styles better, they are much more interested in the whole liminality aspect, while people who like the more mainstream genres like house, techno, trance. Um, they are actually less interested in all these ritualistic aspects. So what, what this actually says, I can, I can go into it more deeply if you want, but drums, dubstep, drum and bass, harder styles and psychedelic, I would say these, connect, these genres connect very strongly to the ritualistic aspects, while trance, techno and house are in many respects non-related to it. Um, Another very interesting finding is that drug use or self-reported drug use 
was not, except for here, not related at all to any of these characteristics. So, people who take drugs on the events, and people who don't take drugs on the events, for instance, there's no difference between them as to the importance of transcendence. So, that's, that's an unexpected finding we had, I think, because in literature also you find that these ritualistic characteristics, that they are related to drug use. So, it, it could have to do with self-report measures and social expectations that people would, would rather not say that they take a lot of hard drugs. Um, okay, thanks. Um, and the same with alcohol consumption. So, I think that's also a point of discussion because here our findings kind of contradict the literature. I still have two more minutes. Yeah. How am I going to fill two minutes with what's <laughs> left? <laughs> so, uh, to conclude, I think, I think it's a very, for, from my point of view as a media psychologist, you might say, it's a valuable first step in translating it to quantitative inquiry. Um, to some of you, it might seem stupid to try to do that because you lose a lot of information when you go from thick qualitative descriptions to quantitative. I think they both should coexist and complement one another. Um, and based on our results, that it seems that music taste, gender and age seem more defining of the experience than drug or alcohol use, which was kind of unexpected. Um, yeah, but as you, as you see, in interpreting these results, some of it makes sense in light of the literature, other of it doesn't. So I think there's quite some room for discussion yet, and um, I'd be very glad to hear your, your thoughts on it or to get some input on it, because uh, some of these findings I don't know. I don't know myself yet how to make sense of it. Yeah, thank you. Question. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And uh, there was no need to apologize. I've been waiting for this for years. So I'm very happy to okay. you know, do proper mixed methods analysis and electronic methods music. It's just not possible. You always end up with qualitative analysis because we don't have a model yet. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, my question is at the beginning, when you develop the characteristics, um, you talked about a, a panel of experts. Yeah, these were the in order to, you know, and what you reference were yeah. primarily academic papers, and I'm wondering whether you, you can, what your panel, of, who, you know, who your panel of experts consisted of, because I would be slightly careful in just yeah. taking themes out of academic literature where there, there's a danger of bypassing what what participants oh, yeah. actually feel or experience on the dance floor if they're not. I actually, uh, I actually asked all my colleagues whom I know that they sometimes visit, visit electronic dance music events. So there, there were, besides the three others to the paper, there were three others. But they were all communication scientists and academics. So I think it's a valid point. Um, but then to counter it, I think the first author, Jeffrey, he's very, very heavily involved both as an organizer and a participant in, uh, in these, especially like the more underground club events. But it's a very, it's a very good concern actually, because the model only um, explained about 70% of for explained variants, so that means we still have. 30% unexplained, so there must be a way to optimize the questionnaire, so that could be something to look into. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to come back on what you said at the beginning of the presentation between the different kind of spaces where uh, EDM even take place, and you just mentioned the difference between big festivals and more uh, clubs. Was it something you tested in the questionnaire, the type of places people used to go 
because I think it would be very interesting to see if there is. Yeah. Yes. Um, we did ask them. Mm -hmm. We asked them, can you recall an event that for you was typical of an EDM experience you had in the past year? Um, which event is it? And then, um, in which genre would you predominantly rate this event? So we asked them themselves. But the fact that it wasn't... Actually, we haven't done that. We've been lazy. Um, we could have recoded their... It was an open question. So they said, Tomorrowland Sunrise Festival. So we should have actually recoded it into bigger, medium or smaller events. Um, and maybe for future analysis, I should do that. It's not that much work. But I didn't include it in the analysis. We had, we actually have information on it, mm -hmm. but I didn't do it because we, I would have to recode that open question. Mm -hmm. But it's, it makes sense to do it. Uh, it's uh, because I've done, well, yeah, it was very little, but try uh, to use active, uh, uh, social network analysis uh, with data coming from uh, uh, like uh, some kick type of website, mm -hmm. uh, also to kind of map how different uh, musical venues are connected, uh, and because there's always this question with musical genre, I mean you can, like classical yeah, music, you true. can go to see uh, Mozart, um, even at a music hall, or like to see, um, what's the name of the Dutch, uh, André Rieux, yeah, André Rieux, yeah. or uh, a concert of, of Philip Glass, and it's all in a way music, uh, classical music, but it's very different yeah. experience. So. And I know that genre, especially here, is very difficult, mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to point it out from the beginning that we just took a very mm -hmm. pragmatic approach to it. Because, mm -hmm. especially when you want to quantify it, you need to somehow make abstraction of it, because otherwise... It but my point is that maybe musical venues might be a good way to, yeah. to, um, to approach this. That actually, instead of this table, uh, which is very complicated, it would make more sense to have just three columns. Yeah. Smaller event, middle, larger event. I think that's a very good suggestion. Thanks. I have other questions. Uh, so, I, so what's it on the bingo here? Uh, it's really more of a comment. Um, Three hundred respondents is quite good, but you'll have more power for your stats if you can get more. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if you had your questionnaire in English rather than in yeah, Dutch. Yeah, we can. We, we did it in Dutch English. now, so yeah. Because in, when I travelled to, I was in Hungary at music at the electronic dance music festival, and people, hung, Hungarian people, were speaking to Norwegian people in English, and it's used as a translation language. So, but that, 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 is, that is definitely something we're aiming to do to translate. It. Yeah. Then at the same time, you have more respondents, but if you have fifty from Hungary and twenty from France and fifteen more from. Belgium and then, yeah, then 100 from the UK. It's also more fragmented and then you don't know if you are talking about the same yeah. experience. But, but then on the other hand you have work, this isn't work on EDM, this is work in online EDM fans in yeah. Holland and Belgium. Yes, yes, so, very much. You know, ultimately you want 10,000 respondents. But yeah, I, yeah, that is true. And it, So that was interesting. Did it, are you using Anna for testing? Yeah, yeah. Um, this, so is, this is just correlation analysis. Correlation analysis. This is, uh, this is ANOVA. Right. Um, so are your distributions normal? Are you confident that it's... Yeah, yeah, we checked on these things. So I, did, I report them in the paper, sure. the test of sphericity and uh, uh, uniformity that we did, but I forgot to include them here. Cool. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that in itself is an interesting result. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you could go to use logistic regression or this your exact test or other things. Yeah. It sounds like this works pretty well. Well, we could not do that kind of thing now because we were mostly interested in 
questionnaire, uh, and then we did not have any specific hypothesis about all these relationships, so that's purely explorational, and then kind of doesn't make sense to already start doing these huge uh, regression models because it's very explorative at, at this point. I mean, for me, I think this is beginning to really powerful work, and this is the sort of thing that should be done in all sorts of popular music studies. Yeah. And it, it works very well to blend with, with so, so that people who are doing qualitative work or are doing cultural studies work can draw upon this as well and you know, test their own research again, against yeah. this, because there's, there's not nearly enough of this sort of work, I agree with you, yeah. in popular music studies. So I, I think it's, for me, I think it's, it's great. Well, I know a lot of quantitative research who only believe in this, and that's kind of counterproductive. I really believe in the in the, the discussion between both or in the complementation of both. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.